All righty. Well, welcome to the Billabong, including if you're uh, watching online um, later on. In the last five weeks um, for this series called I'm Not Religious, we've been looking at some of the central elements of what it means to actually be a follower of Jesus. Um, Christians are sometimes assumed to be kind of one version of religious people among a few different ones in the world. And some are, but I would argue that considering that Jesus sought to condemn much of the religious practice around him and the religious leaders around him, following Jesus is, is so far from, from being a stereotypical religious person um, and, and is more about becoming like Jesus himself and imitating his life, and modelling our life after his. And so just to review one time, one last time, we've uh, covered these things, that God is alive in us, and we kind of return back to that today, that we have rhythms and patterns in our lives, not not a religious kind of pattern, but spending time with God. It's a relationship that we hear God, not just a voice in our head, but actually God speaking to us, that we live a life of generosity, not out of duty, but of lifestyle, and treasure the Bible, again, not reading it out of duty, but believing that God speaks through it and uses it to speak to us. So I want to address, address today, uh, after all that, the most important thing in my view, the most significant thing, um, partly because of the day that it is today. We, uh, we don't follow the, generally we don't follow the more traditional um, church calendar, the, the liturgical calendar, if you're used to that. Um, but we do recognise some of the things in what's sometimes known as the church calendar, like Christmas, we celebrate uh, the, the, the birth of Jesus, and of course at Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus, those are, are special days. Um, today is called Pentecost Sunday, and um, I said off the cuff last week when I was you know, leading towards this, was I said something um, along the lines of Christmas and Easter is irrelevant, without Pentecost, which is not really what I meant. I kind of have to bite my words there. What I really mean is without Pentecost, the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, in a sense, becomes an unfinished story, especially when it comes to the impact on our lives. Whether or not you you know anything about the Jesus story, we do believe as Christians that he was born, he lived, he died, he rose again, so that all who believe in him could have eternal life and that they could be reconciled to God, that we could be reconnected to God, which is what we were created for. Um, After Jesus rose, the the small bunch who followed him, they believed this, and their lives had been transformed and turned around and changed, and they wanted to tell others the good news about this Jesus who had come and given them a new start. Then Jesus said this to them, He was eating with them once and he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water. Baptism was a a symbol of this new life with God, old life going away and coming up out of the water into new life. But in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The word baptized is a non-English word word that's been kind of turned into an English word, baptizo, baptized. Uh, It just means to immerse or to dip. In fact, when a ship sunk, sometimes the word was the ship was baptized. The Holy Spirit, who uh, Jesus said we would be uh, uh, baptized with, immersed in, we understand from the scriptures and, and what Jesus taught himself is God himself at work on the earth. This is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, wait until he comes and you become fully immersed, like shipwrecked, overcome by this this God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And this group of 11 close followers and then 120 followers all together, they're meeting together and they do that. They wait and they wait and they pray together. They meet in this room. They wait And today we read the story of what happened. And I can't think of anything more significant, anything more world-altering for us. And so I kind of have been approaching today with fear and trembling, going, God, show show up, speak to us, show us who you really are. So let me pray and we'll uh, read Acts chapter 2 and explore why as Christians we can declare, why we must declare I'm not religious, but I believe in the supernatural. 
Father, we thank you for this day and what it represents. We thank you for Jesus and his example to us and what he has done for us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit promised and sent to us your very presence to fill our lives and to give us power to do what Jesus did. Lord, we know that we have good news, but we don't want to go and try and do something with it in our own strength. We want you, Holy Spirit, to come and help us and empower us for the mission we have. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds today, that you would speak to us through the scriptures by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is uh, Acts chapter 2, which says, On the day of Pentecost, now this was a Jewish festival that happened 50 days, that's Pente, um, 50 days after um, Passover. So Passover was around the time Jesus died. 50 days later, they had the Jewish festival of Pentecost. And on that day, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. You may or may not have heard this story before, whether you have, it's Quite extraordinary, and our inclination here is uh, one of a couple of things: is either to read it just as a story, you know, a fictional story. Oh, it's got a meaning to it, but it didn't. It's not real. Or maybe read it as a true story, but a kind of a strange one. You know, that's unique. We don't see that happening today. We don't, you know, come to church and all of a sudden there's like a gale that blows through the place or anything like that. I want you to consider for a second, though, that this actually happened with very ordinary people like you and I. If you're not sure about that, just go with me for a second, that it actually happened with these ordinary people, about this many people actually, that are in this room right now. And, and that a sound from heaven, like a mighty windstorm, came through. And, and there's something like flame settling on each person's head. And everyone in the room beginning to speak in languages that they didn't cognitively understand. Just imagine this. Just picture this in your mind for a sec. Story goes on. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. In other words, there were people from various cultures, every nation. So they spoke all different languages because of where they came from. And they were nearby. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Because the believers shouldn't be speaking those languages. They should speak their language. They were completely amazed and said, how can this be? These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and it goes through the list of all the different multicultural community that's there, right through to Cretans and Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, as you would, amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, Ah, there's drunk. That's all. You want a bit loopy. Now, if you've been a churchgoer for a while, I would like you to put aside for a second your assumption or understanding of what's happening here about speaking in tongues and baptism in the Spirit and all that kind of thing. If you, you know, let's just set that aside for a second. Effectively, there's nothing super complicated about what's happening here. It's supernatural, but it's not complicated. By this point, we know in the biblical narrative from what Jesus has said that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's not three gods, but one God who is a family. Three persons so united to each other that they're actually one being, one God. Your head will not rationally understand it, but your heart will burst because of it, because of the incredible love and the fact that only this God could be a God of love because he created us out of the overflow of his love within himself already. So God is Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. And in this event, the Father and Jesus send the Holy Spirit, the, the God at work on the earth, the Spirit of God. And unlike before, the Holy Spirit now fills all those who know God, because the ones who trust Jesus. And the languages they begin to speak are simply a miracle that the Holy Spirit does to catch the attention of the multicultural crowd in that place at the time. It's not complicated, it's just a miracle. Uh, it's no different to what Jesus did. Jesus performed amazing miracles so that others would see the power of God at work and he'd have a chance to tell them about the good news that God loves them. Miraculous, grabs their attention, let me tell you about God. That was what Jesus did. The difference here is it's now happening with 120 people, ordinary people at one time, not Jesus the superhuman, 120 normal people in one moment, in one instant. I want you to imagine if that was to happen here. If, if right now in this room that happened and you were sort of on the outside of the glass there, you were looking in, I imagine the responses that you would have and you or your friends would have looking in would be similar, right? Some of us would say, what in the world is going on here? I know that person doesn't speak Mandarin, but I can hear them speaking Mandarin. And there's this wind and there's fire. What is going on? Others would say, oh, a bunch of wackos. It's only 10.30 in the morning and they're already drunk. You know, there would be different reactions similar to in this story. If we notice something that's unquestionably supernatural, we're sometimes inclined to dumb it down because it's not within our box, our worldview, our, our box of how things operate. But if you're open to the fact that this happened and that similar things happen today and want to know why, listen to the explanation with an open mind. And that's, that's my challenge to us today. Peter explains, he stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Bit of humour there. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. So here's a, a man who lived much before who, who, who predicted that this was going to happen because God inspired him to do so. And this prophet Joel said, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now that means just see or hear a revelation from God. Prophesy does not necessarily mean predict the future. But that will prophesy something from God. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams from God. In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. Some of this is imagery then about some, that things that are to come. We're not going to, the sky's not going to go red necessarily right now, but the sun will become dark and the moon will, will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth by doing powerful miracles, wonders and signs through him. As you well know. But God knew that what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. This is Peter speaking now, by the way. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. Biggest miracle of all. For death could not keep him in its grip. What Peter then does, and I'll skip the next bit, he explains how David, this central figure of the Jewish faith, King David, uh, actually pointed to this Messiah, this Saviour, this promised one. Um, and, and Jesus is that person. So then Peter continues, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah, God and Saviour. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? What, what should we do in response to this? Now, this is a question that no one can force you to ask. 
Only, you only ask this if something within you says that against all logic that this is true, what we've read about this Jesus. That a poor Jewish builder, born to an unwed teenager claiming to be a virgin, performed extraordinary miracles, taught a small band of followers how God was almost nothing like what the official religious leaders taught. He was killed for that, rose from death, and promised his followers that he and God his Father would send God the Holy Spirit to fill them so they could live a life just like him. Now, You've got to be crazy to believe that. <laughs> and if that's hogwash to you, you don't kind of ask, oh, what should we do about this? Only if there's something that pierces your heart. Even if you don't really get it in your rational mind and think, am I crazy? <laughs> but something tugs at you and says, it's actually true. He's, he's, he's true. What he said was, was legit. Only then would you ask this question, what shall we do? You don't want to respond in any way if you don't believe it. For me, this is a question that God can prompt you to ask whether you've, you're a churchgoer or not. Even after I, I said to Jesus when I was a teenager, my life is in your hands, Jesus, I want to follow you. Yes, it became more than religion, but I still had the box inside which my Christianity fit. Read the Bible, pray, serve, give, all of all of that which I loved and I even wanted to go into ministry to help others do the same and felt I could make a difference. But there was nothing that supernatural about it. And don't get me wrong, I believe it's an absolute miracle that we can have a relationship with God. But, but it wasn't visible. Jesus' life was naturally supernatural and visibly supernatural. You couldn't deny that there was something beyond just normal, happening through him. And so when he sent the Holy Spirit to the 120 believers, it just happened in exactly the same way. The supernatural power of God became immediately visible. And over time, I've started to observe this in people who are filled with the Holy Spirit in our, in our world. At first, you kind of, I just kind of think, well, they're, they're drunk. And that, that's kind of the attitude, you know. Knowing they weren't really, because it's different, but that would challenge my box when you saw something supernatural happening. Now, I don't care about the box anymore. I don't care about being comfortable. I want to know, what shall I do? What do you want of me, God? And I want you to consider, Christian or not, if that's your question too, if there's this kind of holy discontent and you want to know what this Jesus is really about, whether today or sometime in the future, if your question is, what shall I do in response to this? Here's the answer. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins. That just means turn around and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. I promise you I won't do that today. Strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church, not the building, the community of believers, added to the believers that day. About 3,000 of all, biggest church growth strategy you've ever seen, 120 to 3,000 like that. Now we're almost at the end of the chapter here and the last six verses are simply a picture of what happened next, what it, what it looked like then. And, and what it describes is effectively what I've been talking about for the last six weeks. What does it mean not to be religious but actually model our lives after Jesus? I, um, I didn't really need to preach the last five sermons. It's basically all here in a nutshell, so sorry about that. Um, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. There's that generosity piece. They, were, uh, they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship. Each day 
The Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. That for me is the dream for what the church would be like once again. It's an incredibly beautiful picture of life modelled after Jesus. It's what I want for my family, my friends, my church, for the church. But it's not an instruction of what to do. Hear me on this. It's not, it's not like do this and you'll, you'll get spirit-filled. It's what happens when we turn to Jesus and are filled with the Spirit. I mean, it's, it's sort of a snowball. It, it feeds onto itself, but it, it's what happens. It's a picture of Spirit-filled life. We can't fabricate this kind of life. We can't pretend to live like Jesus. We can only, only turn from our sins to God Be baptised if we haven't yet and wait for the Holy Spirit to come and do his thing. And I'm just not content anymore with trying to live like Jesus and trying to tell people about Jesus and trying to be more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, I want you to come and make us more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, I want you to show up and turn heads so we can tell people about Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. We want you to be in this place and come like wind and like fire to fill your people for the mission of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray you would come and touch the lives of everyone we touch because you, Holy Spirit, have the power of the kingdom of heaven at your fingertips and we taste a glimpse of that kingdom when we experience you. Come and fill us, our church, our lives, our families, our homes. In Jesus' name. I'm not finished yet. I'm just carried away. (laughs) As Christians in a fairly conservative, um, kind of contemporary, Bible-based church, um, I know that we're kind of scared sometimes of the Holy Spirit stuff that will make us like the Pentecostals. Thing is, the ratio of uh, Pentecostals to non-Pentecostals with the first Christians was 120 to none. I'm sort of tongue-in-cheek there, but, you know, they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, the God who did the supernatural through them from the get-go. Our Christian box is, is nice. It's kind of comfortable how, where we sit, no doubt about it. Or maybe if you don't call yourself a Christian today, your life hopefully is nice and comfortable. The question is, do you want to stay there? Or do, you want to, or do you see a God who wants to smash that box open? And if so, are you willing to say, what shall I do to respond to this, this Jesus? The answer is, as Peter said, repent from or, or turn from your sins and turn to God. That just means make a commitment that God be the one you live to please, not yourself, no matter what that means. Another way of saying that, you know, turn Repent from sin to God is just to say, turn from you and your ways to God and his ways. And the good news is that others will help you do that. You don't have to go it alone. We're not meant to go it alone. The next part is be baptised for the forgiveness of sins. We don't have a pool right here, but we can dunk you in the lake afterwards if you want, or probably better just schedule another time for you to be baptised. The symbol of the old life being washed away and receiving a new life as you come out of the water. And finally, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't get caught up too much in the order, because the Holy Spirit is ready when you are. We're going to pray together and and ask that God forgive us our sins as we turn to him, repent and believe. And following that, as a way of asking the Holy Spirit to come, um, if the team want to come up now, um, a couple of us, a couple of teams, just going to play a song. It's it's um it's based on this passage. Uh, it's really just a prayer. It's one of the most uh, ancient prayers of the church that says this: "Come, Holy Spirit." So um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll we'll sing that for you. And um, towards the end of that, we'll stand and we're going to um, just worship God again before we before we close. Father, we come to you this morning with a desire to know you more deeply, to understand more fully what it means to live the Jesus life.
and to ask that your Holy Spirit come and fill us. Before that, Lord, we, we just give our lives to you again. Father, we want to turn away from all of what we do, which is centered in brokenness and in selfishness. We want to repent, to turn, and we want to turn towards you, knowing that we will get it wrong, but that you have forgiven us, and when we get it wrong, you continue to forgive us. And so we just do that again now. We turn from ourselves and towards you, as we have done through communion, but just with our hearts focused on you right now. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice you made for us. And as we just spend time to wait for you now, Holy Spirit, open our hearts for you.